<laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Uh, welcome back to uh, the Montesquieu Forum Conference on uh, the Spirit of Commercial Republics, uh, Money, Music, and Morals uh, in the 18th Century. Our first session this morning uh, has two speakers. Uh, our first speaker is Professor Thomas Merrill, uh, who is just recently been promoted to associate professor. <laughs> and garbage man. And garbage man. <laughs> associate professor garbage man and father uh, at, um, Ameri at American University. Uh, his great area of expertise is the political science and philosophy of David Hume, uh, Cambridge University Press, within the last six months, uh, published uh, Tom's first book on Hume and the politics of enlightenment. Uh, he's also written a bit on C.S. Lewis and on Descartes. Yes. 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 <laughs> I sort of remember, did I write on C.S. Lewis? Yes. And, <laughs> And also a, a letter uh, on Heidegger and technology that has been published and is very good. Your mom knows what it's <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Stuart knows my CV better than I do. <laughs> and uh, the great trust and value that I place in my friend uh, Tom Merrill is evidenced uh, by the fact that uh, I sent my daughter to American University, where she's finishing her freshman year, and I have placed Tom in charge of <laughs> making sure that she does not get into any trouble. <laughs> and she has not. Uh, our second speaker today, uh, this morning, uh, will be Professor Michael Zuckert uh, from uh, the University of Notre Dame. Uh, Michael's dissertation uh, was on John Locke's uh, first <laughs> was on John Locke's first treatise of government. It seems to be an odd thing with which to begin an introduction, uh, except this close to 500 page doctoral dissertation. Apparently, his advisor didn't know what he was doing and didn't give him very good advice. I think it was Leo Strauss. Uh, uh, it's still vastly the best work on Locke's first treatise. It's still the book to consult if one wants to begin the study of Locke. Uh, he's published several books, one launching liberalism, a uh, collection of essays on John Locke and liberalism. He's published several books on natural rights and republicanism. He's been the principal advisor to several PBS series, including one on uh, Alexander Hamilton, uh, told that there's some kind of play that's <laughs> going around city to city that might be important. And uh, maybe once you go back and look at the PBS series, that Michael had something to do with. Uh, he's received uh, grants from the most prestigious places in America, including NEH. NSF, Woodrow Wilson, Earhart. Uh, currently, he's working on a book called Continuing uh, the Constitution on the Post-Civil War Amendments. Uh, and he tells me he's been working for a very long time with others, a book that will be finished about 2024 on, <laughs> on Machiavelli and Shakespeare. Uh, That's an optimistic guess. <laughs> uh, we await all of Professor Zuckert's further books, including the Machiavellian Shakespeare. Uh, today, uh, Professor Zuckert will be talking about uh, Montesquieu and money. There'll be a minute or two break between the two talks because we need to set up a computer for part of Professor Zuckert's talk. Uh, but our first talk is by Professor Merrill on the subject of Hume on commerce. Thank you, Stuart. <laughs> I want to start by thanking the Miller Center and the, the Templeton Foundation for funding this conference. You know, one of the best things about uh, having a career in higher education are these little programs where you actually have communities of people that you get together and speak with and 
students that get very excited. So I was um, especially interested and excited to talk to students last night, and I think it's really a testament to Stuart and everyone else who works in the program here. Um, so I just want to say thank you to Pamela and to other people for, for making this possible. And I also want to say that it's a big honor to be speaking um, at the conference, um, not only the other distinguished guests, of whom there are many, but also um, lots of uh, distinguished people in the audience, uh, people who uh, are experts on Hume in some cases. Um, I, my general policy is to only speak to audiences that know less about my topic than I do. Um, that's impossible uh, today, so, um, but I want the free lunch, so I'm going to try to make this work. Anyway, um, so let me begin. Uh, my topic today is David Hume's views on commerce. Now, the commerce part of that sentence is politically controversial, as we all know. One need, think only of the, one need only think of the fact that Bernie Sanders, a self-proclaimed socialist, is giving Hillary Clinton a run for her money in the Democratic primary, while making a pretty plausible case that Clinton is too cozy with the financiers of Wall Street. On the other side, Donald Trump is giving the Republican Party establishment heart palpitations, largely by appealing to people who feel left behind by the globalizing, highly technological economy we live in. Free market capitalism, or at least the current system that we have, which justifies itself by appealing to free market ideas, seems to be under attack from both sides. Of course, one ought not to put too much stock in the antics of presidential candidates during the primaries, since shocking people is a tried and true method of getting the sleepy American electorate to pay attention. Nonetheless, there is something serious behind the crankiness of primary voters. There's a general sense afoot in the country, on right and left alike, that elites are manipulating the system for their own benefit. Consider, for example, the familiar worries about growing inequality in America, the fact that the top 1% is accumulating all the growth in income, as Thomas Piketty has taught us, or the fact that the income of the median person in the United States has, we're told, not appreciably grown since 1980. Whatever one might ultimately want to say about these facts, no serious observer of the political scene can avoid having an opinion about them. Now, I spend my professional time reading the, the thinkers like Hume and Adam Smith, who made the original case for what we've come to call classical liberalism uh, or commercial republicanism. And the striking and somewhat surprising thing about our current debates from this point of view is the extent to which our idea of free markets has gotten entangled with our anger against elites. Since Adam Smith, Hume, and Montesquieu understood themselves to be opponents, not the friends of, the opponents of unearned privilege. Feudalism was, after all, what they were trying to destroy. So the most obvious question for anyone thinking about a topic like human commerce is this. As we wrestle with questions of inequality, political economy, and so forth today, is there anything we can learn from the original proponents of classical liberalism? Even if we don't expect to find specific policy prescriptions, is there anything that we've forgotten that those proponents knew and that might deepen our understanding of our own time? I believe that the original commercial Republicans do offer an approach to these questions rather different than the ones we're most familiar with today, one that we might learn from. My title indicates I'm going to explore this question by thinking about Hume's writings on commerce, in particular the series of essays on political economy that we find at the beginning of part two Hume's essays. As will become apparent, I do think that Hume's defense of commerce is much more populist, democratic uh, in spirit than you might expect. More importantly, I want to suggest to you that Hume's defense of commerce is intimately related to, not really intelligible without, his views on what might be called the problem of enlightenment, the question of how philosophy should speak to or present itself to or generally relate to ordinary life or ordinary people. And in order to make this case, I'm going to tell you a story story about how Hume's case for commerce develops. I think thing in Hume's, he often presents things one way, and only later on do you realize that he didn't tell you the full story. And I'm going to have to spend some time with an episode of Hume's argument that seems, at first glance, directly contrary to what I just said about the popular spirit of Hume's defense of commerce. Hume's apparently amoral willingness to give advice to a self-aggrandizing sovereign about how to increase his power. So that's the plan. Strangely enough, Hume begins his discussion of commerce with a seemingly unrelated remark. The greater part of mankind, he says, may be divided into two groups, shallow thinkers who fall short of the truth and abstruse thinkers who go beyond it. Most of us, of course, are the first. <laughs> there are some of us who are the second. Hume says they're good to have those people around. Sure. <laughs> but there are some persons of, quote, solid understanding who somehow discover genuine general truths about the world. 
The problem is that most of us cannot distinguish between the abstruse thinkers and the solid thinkers. We tend to see things only through the lens of our particular interest and distrust anything that smacks of sophistication. So Hume always likes to set up these two you know, sort of dichotomies, like there's some people only see particulars, and other people only see generals. Somehow he's going to try to find something in the middle. Um, there are general principles, Hume asserts, that prevail in the general course of things. But then we're compelled to wonder if we all, most of us, start by seeing things only through the realm of particulars, how is it that, that people who see things, the more general things, are ever able to communicate with them? How is enlightenment possible? If most or all of us tend to interpret things through the lens of our particular perspective, how could we ever ascend to some larger view of things? And partly what, what I want to think about today is why does Hume start with this problem in relation to his discussion of commerce? He begins his actual defense of commerce by remarking that in every developed society, a third class of person develops after the first two, the essential classes of farmers on the one hand and manufacturers on the other. At some point in human history, agriculture becomes so productive that far fewer hands are needed to produce enough food for the whole society than were required at earlier stages. Hume asks a simple question. What should be done with these super superfluous workers? Should they apply themselves to the finer arts, that is to say, to luxuries or refinements? That's his opening question. Or should they be claimed by the sovereign and made to serve in his armies for the sake of expanding the dominions of the state abroad spreading its fame. Not to put too fine a point on it, which course of action will most strengthen the sovereign's military power? The essay of, of commerce is an extended deliberation on just this question. As Hume presents it, it is, in the first instance, a question for the sovereign, not a question for the rest of us. A question to be decided in the light of the sovereign's interests and in the sovereign's necessities. It's necessary to underline the apparent amorality of Hume's treatment of this question. The essay assumes that the sovereign is motivated solely by a desire to increase his military power. And it never stops to ask whether it might be morally problematic to increase the power of a sovereign, regardless of whether that sovereign will use that power wisely or not. Hume thus poses the question, why should a sovereign concerned with his own power not simply draft all the superfluous workers into his army? Is it not the case, uh, and this is just paraphrasing him, is it not the case that Sparta, which banished commerce and luxury, and dedicated its citizens to its army, was able to raise and support armies that were greater by far, at least relative to their size, than the armies of, of nations today. Why should not the sovereigns, quote, consult their own interests more than the happiness of their subjects and return to the maxims of ancient policy by banishing commerce and luxury? Hume offers not a hint of moral critique of the sovereign's desire to acquire. Instead, he teaches the sovereign a lesson in realpolitik. Sparta, he says, was able to inspire such extreme public spiritedness in its citizens only through an extraordinary concurrence of circumstances. Being free states, the citizens believed they were fighting for themselves. Being small states, they were continually endangered by external threats. The two causes together kept the Spartans in a continual state of heightened tension. But neither of these causes is easy for a monarch to reproduce. The first, since it would require a different form of government, the second, because the sovereign wants to dominate his neighbors, not live in fear of them. Self-aggrandizing sovereign must then seek some other way to motivate his citizens to fight. Quote, sovereigns must take mankind as they find them. They cannot pre pretend to introduce any violent change in their principles or ways of thinking. The sovereign's problem echoes Hume's own problem of enlightenment, how to get human beings to serve a goal that they do not recognize as their own. In the essays, commerce first comes to view as an answer to this question. Hume makes the following argument. In a, in a society without manufacturers and mechanic arts, most of the people must be farmers. But without manufacturers, those farmers, even though they are able to produce more, they are able to produce more goods through their skill and industry, can still acquire nothing beyond what they can make for themselves. They have, therefore, no reason, quote, to increase their skill and industry. But when there are manufacturers to acquire, the, reason, the workers have a reason to work harder. Quote, the superfluity is not lost, but is exchanged with manufacturers for those commodities, which men's luxury makes them covet. Hume assures the sovereign that the labor is not lost to public use. That is not lost to the sovereign's desire for self-aggrandizement. For the manufacturers can always be converted when the need arises into military power through a tax or a draft. Hume encourages the sovereign to see the manufacturers of commercial society, although ostensibly private property, as a storehouse of labor 
It can at any time be taken from sovereign by the sovereign for its own purposes. The difference between the Spartan strategy and the commercial strategy then has nothing to do with morality. They're merely different ways of motivating human beings to act for the sake of the sovereign's interest. Quote, it's a violent method and in most cases impracticable to oblige the worker to toil in order to raise from the land more than what subsists himself and his family. Furnish him with manufactures and commodities, and he'll do it of himself. Afterwards, you will find it easy to seize some part of his superfluous labor and employ it in the public service without giving him his wanted return. Hume thus offers the sovereign, perhaps also his readers, a hard-headed lesson in human motivation. Allow the workers to think they're working for themselves, and they'll work much harder for you than if you told them the truth at the start. The key to this advice is that, is that the sovereign's interest and the worker's interest, or at least what they think is in their interest, coincide. In light of the geopolitical competition of Europe in the 18th century, sovereigns of Hume's times would no doubt be well advised to take Hume's advice. But Hume has not put all of his cards on the, ta on the table, for there are unintended, or at least unarticulated, consequences of that advice, consequences that only become clear as his argument proceeds. <coughs> First, he points out that commerce will increase the number of persons in a state who are relatively well off, and that this is good for the state. Quote, it will not, I hope, be considered as a superfluous digression if I here observe that as the multitude of mechanical arts is advantageous, so is the great number of persons to whose share the productions of those arts fall. Superfluity in the economy leads Hume to make an observation that might well seem, from the point of view of the sovereign's naked self-interest, superfluous. But the betterment of the economic condition of the great mass of citizens is one that Hume somewhat unexpectedly endorses on what seem to be normative grounds. Quote, every person, if possible, ought to enjoy the fruits of his labor in full possession of all the necessaries, many of the conveniences of life. The state is stronger when the people at large are well off, not to mention that when a few have most of the riches, they'll use their power to oppress the poor. It's in this regard that England has a great advantage, quote, a great advantage over any nation at present in the world, that in England the common people are richer than the people in any other nation. But it's not until the following essay of Refinement in the Arts that Hume indicates the full consequences of liberating commerce for political life. There we learn that commerce brings with it a sociological or cultural revolution that cannot help but prepare for a political one. In societies without commerce and manufacturers, Hume says, there tend to be two classes of persons the owners of land and their vassals or tenants. Pre-commercial society had at its core masters and slaves, in large part simply because of the economic realities of that kind of society. The vassals are, quote, necessarily dependent and fitted for slavery and subjection, especially when they possess no riches and are not valued for their knowledge in agriculture, as must always be the case where the arts are neglected. The owners of the land, on the other hand, quote, naturally erect themselves into petty tyrants and must either submit to an absolute master for the sake of peace and order, or if they will preserve their independency like the ancient barons, they must fall into feuds and contests among themselves to throw the whole society into such confusion, as is perhaps worse than the most despotic government. That, in a nutshell, is Hume's analysis of feudal pre-Tudor English society. But where the pursuit of luxury increases commerce, quote, the peasants by proper cultivation of the land become rich and independent. No longer are there only masters and slaves. A new type of human being comes to the fore. Well, while the tradesmen and merchants acquire a share of the property, draw authority and consideration to the middling rank of men, who are the best and firmest basis of public liberty, these submit not to slavery like the peasants from poverty and meanness of spirit. And having no hopes of tyrannizing over others like the barons, they are not tempted for the sake of that gratification submit to the tyranny of their sovereign. They covet equal laws, which may secure their property and preserve them from monarchical as well as aristocratical tyranny. The middling rank of men denotes both an economic condition and a psychic disposition. These human beings have enough economic wherewithal not to be directly dependent on another human being. That economic condition is in turn the indispensable condition for seeing themselves as self-ruling property owners. Hume sketches in these few lines the basic thrust of his interpretation of English history from the beginning of the Tudor reigns up to the achievement of parliamentary supremacy in the 17th century. Commerce was, Hume claims, an essential cause of the political revolutions of that century. Quote, the lower house is the support of our popular government, 
and all the world acknowledges that it owed its chief influence and consideration to the increase of commerce, which, flew su which threw such a balance of property into the hands of the commons. Hume neglects to mention the fact of which his contemporaries would have been all too aware, and of which is a major theme of his masterwork, the history of England, that the commercial revolution that produced the middling rank of men culminated, not entirely accidentally, in the execution of one king and the replacement of another. But if we keep these facts in mind, his advice to a sovereign takes on a different cast. For if English experience is any guide, the sovereign can liberate commerce and increase his military power only at the price of unleashing a far-reaching social transformation. <coughs> That transformation predictably leads to the gradual development of a class of human beings that will sooner or later want some say in ruling themselves. But differently, Hume's advice to the sovereign has a nasty surprise hidden inside of it. Oops. A sovereign who liberates commerce in order to bolster his military power sets in motion a series of changes that will undermine his power or that of his successors, and may even get them killed. Hume's amorality, it seems, runs deeper or is it of a different character than we first thought. Of course, if any sovereign reading Hume's essays is deceived, that does not necessarily mean that Hume lied. It's not so clear to me who's writing to sovereigns at his time. He's describing something that's already happened. Um, it may simply have been true that early modern European monarchs faced a choice between not liberating commerce and losing out to stronger neighbors on the one hand, and liberating commerce and fatally weakening their monarchies in the long run on the other. That does not change the fact that Hume is perfectly willing to offer European sovereigns the attractive fruit of military power without making its predictable consequences too obvious. In this light, we need to rethink the character of Hume's original advice to the sovereign. His, his, that advice was, in order to get someone to work for you, you should not exhort them or appeal to their public spiritedness. Instead, you should make them think they're working for their own self-interest, even while they're benefiting you or they're working for some end that you have. We can now see, see that Hume's advice to the sovereign was, in fact, an example of that very same advice. He starts his essays by com on commerce by appealing simply to the naked self-interest of the sovereign, as the sovereign's likely to understand them. And he goes on to tell the sovereign how to pursue those interests most effectively, that is, without any constraint from morality or the common good. At the same time, he only alludes to the predictable consequences of that advice, which could well be the destruction of both the monarch, the monarch and the monarchy. He puts into practice the very advice he gives the sovereign. Yet in the service of what, we wonder, the service amorality of Hume's advice to the sovereign, while not false, seems not to be the deepest element of what Hume is up to in the essays on commerce. And at least what that uh, deeper element is is not clear in those first two essays. The, the meaning of Hume's enlightenment remains to be ascertained. So one might summarize the argument to this point by saying that the rise in the middle class is the submerged theme of those first two essays shapes the surface of Hume's advice to the sovereigns without quite coming to the surface. For under, to understand the full meaning of Hume's enlightenment is to this social group that we must turn our attention. This is not, of course, the first time in Hume's work that the question of the, quote, middling rank of men has come up. In an early essay on essay writing, Hume had described his task in the essays as being a kind of ambassador from the dominions of learning to those of conversation meaning a kind of intermediary between enlightenment or philosophers and the world of polite, i.e. non-philosophic society. Earlier than that, in the treatise of human nature, he described his political project as one of forging a kind of alliance or coalition between skeptical philosophers and those he calls honest gentlemen, meaning something like what we would call today the bourgeoisie. The essays, one might say, has all along been a kind of dialogue between Hume and the middling rank of men. This is an era in which many more people are actually reading things. So this is, this is who he's, these are the people he's reading. But only now, at the end of the essay, these two essays on commerce that I was just discussing, does the audience become something more than a passive auditor of Hume's discourses. Only now does Hume explicitly begin, begin to describe them to themselves in a thematic kind of way, rather than simply speaking to them. In order to understand the full meaning of Hume's enlightenment, then, we need to understand the middling rank of men not in the light of some abstract moral code, but as a specific human type with a distinctive psychic and political outlook. Who then are Hume's interlocutors? What is their world like? Let's begin with a crucial but easily overlooked fact about the middling rank of men. They are, Hume says, quote, the best and firmest basis of public liberty. He means that they are the sociological basis for the liberal political institutions that he had described in part one of the essays. Separation of powers, the rule of law, and so on are critical to preserving political and personal freedom. 
but they cannot exist in a vacuum. Liberal political institutions need a liberal political culture. Above all, they need members of the society to be passionately attached to those institutions and willing, if need be, to fight for them. Institutions cannot possibly sustain themselves with mere parchment barriers and moralistic claims. They need constituencies that resist the inevitable pressure to change and also that allow rulers to rule. Hume argued in part one that individual under liberty under law is the political good, only thing that a sane person would want out of their government, and that the rule of law requires separation of powers. We can now see that the discussion of the middling rank of men produce, provides another crucial element. Even if the purpose of government is only to enforce the, the rules of property, and so therefore to allow us to acquire property, and, and to protect individuals from arbitrary power, intelligent individuals, even sensible knaves, famous Humean figure, will recognize a power, powerful individual interest in preserving and bolstering the middling rank of men as the ultimate support of political freedom. In Montesquieu's terms, the middling rank of men form the spirit of the liberal regime in England. Their habits, opinions, mores, and psychic disposition form its center of gravity. Hume describes their basic look, their basic outlook, first as it shows itself in private or non-political life, and then as it shows itself in public life. The commercial way of life, seen now in its social character, Hume argues, includes three aspects that contribute to human happiness or enlightenment. First, one of those elements is work, which brings challenge and, or, and engagement, which Hume thinks is good both in itself for us as individuals and for its fruits. It's good to make money, but it's also good to have a job just because it's good to work. Second, ages of commerce also tend to provide refinements and even revolutions in intellectual matters. Quote, the spirit of the age affects all the arts and the minds of men being once roused from their lethargy and put into a fermentation, turn themselves on all sides and carry improvements into every art and science. Profound ignorance is totally banished and men enjoy the privilege of rational creatures to think as well as act, to cultivate the pleasures of the mind as well as those of the body. Perhaps the most important benefit, individual benefit of commerce is enlightenment itself. Hume does not mean that most human beings in the commercial age will dedicate their lives to reasoning above all, as does his skeptic, a figure he talks about quite often, or that it would be good if they did. They see reasoning, it seems, not as good or attractive in itself, but good as a means of ruling oneself and a condition for possessing dignity. Hume thinks they're better off for doing so. It's better, even for those who have no attraction to radical questioning, to think for themselves to the extent possible because it's better for, themselves, for them to rule themselves to the extent possible. Finally, commercial society compels men to be more sociable, leads them into cities, makes them pay attention to fashion and social opinion, and practice politeness and the virtues of civility. Commercial society is life with other people, both physically and psychically. Thus Hume concludes, quote, industry, knowledge, and humanity are bound together by an indissoluble chain and are found from experience as well as reason to be peculiar to the more polished what are more and what are commonly denominated the more luxurious ages. I think this is the optimism that David was critiquing yesterday. Politically speaking, the spirit of the middling rank of men is attachment to the rule of law. Here, the rejection of feudalism, the regime defined by masters and slaves, is essential. Psychically, the middling rank of men are defined by the refusal to be either master or slave. Like the honest gentleman in the treatise, they mainly want to be left alone to lead their lives as they see fit. They also recognize, however, that no one can avoid being a master or a slave without some political authority to establish law. Without authority, one cannot avoid being a baron lording it over the serfs or just another one of the serfs. Without law, authority must be just another master. In their own eyes, then, the self-interest of the middling rank of men in material terms, but also, perhaps more importantly, in terms of their own sense, their, their sense of their own dignity is inseparable from the rule of law. The connection between the perceived self-interest and dignity of the middling rank of men and the rule of law, and indeed only that connection, is the reason why they are passionately attached to law. Indeed, they, quote, covet equal laws which may secure their property and preserve them from anarchical as well as aristocratic tyranny. Most important that word in that sentence might be covet. That connection is the psychic spring of the regime, this passionate attachment which binds the loves and hatreds of the citizens together with the institutions of the polity. Now, there's something, no doubt, dressed up, prettified in the portrait of the spirit of the liberal regimes that I've just sketched. I think Hume knows this. 
In part one of the essays, he had remarked that even or especially free governments habitually act with a certain injustice toward the territories which they conquer. Free governments are, he says, silently quoting Machiavelli, the happiest for those who live in them, but also the most ruinous and oppressive to their provinces. Uh, I think he's thinking of Ireland. Uh, monarchs are paradoxically more humane. Yet whatever warts Hume may, Hume may have discerned in commercial republics, he nevertheless took seriously the task of educating and elevating the culture of commercial society. Just as with Hume's advice to a sovereign, that task must start with how his audience already understands it themselves. And the description of the middling rank of men just sketched may be, just, may be best characterized as part reflection on what the middling rank of men already think of themselves, part aspiration for what they might be if they took themselves a little bit more seriously. But differently, humans try in these essays at once to affirm the basic outlook and disposition of his audience and to educate that audience by giving it some degree of clarity about the world, perhaps also itself. The difficulty of accomplishing these two somewhat contradictory goals is perhaps evidence in the sheer size of the rest of part two of the essays. He maybe never gets done with this. Uh, in carrying out that task, Hume will again confront his readers in the essays beginning with of the original contract and ending with idea of a perfect commonwealth with a treatment of English politics that turns out to be concerned primarily with the problem of ideology and politics. It culminates in the praise of a certain kind of skeptical philosophy as the best example of genuine moderation. In the final analysis, it seems, Hume cannot fully spell out what's involved in the moderation of the middling rank of men without pointing to or painting a picture of the spirit or the temper of philosophy. This leads me to ask, could it be that commerce is Hume's introduction to philosophy, the bait that he uses to attract sleepy readers in a way parallel to his use of the sovereign self-interest to bring about the modern revolution? Could it be that commerce is another example of Hume's education by indirection? To discuss that with, however, will take me far too far afield. If you want to get to Michael's talk. Uh, let me instead finish off the story that began with Hume's advice to sovereigns. The essays on political economy that follow Hume's description of the middling rank of men describe the new world of commercial republicanism in ever widening focus. Taken together, the nine essays on commerce and English, England's place in the modern world form a kind of handbook of practical statesmanship and political economy that complements and in a sense completes the institutional political science of part one, the essays. Thus, of money and of interest to treat domestic policy from the point of promoting commerce, while of the balance of trade, of the jealousy of trade, and of the balance of power, treat foreign policy and international trade, culminating in a discussion of a commercial, commercial republic's attitude towards war and the threat of foreign ambition for universal empire. The final two essays in Hume's Handbook of Practical Statesmanship of taxes and of public credit return to domestic matters, albeit matters that bear directly on the polity's ability to project force in conflicts with foreign rivals. Here, let me draw your attention to what Hume says about foreign affairs. In Of the Balance of Trade and Of the Jealousy of Trade, Hume argues from a claim implicit in his advice to sovereigns. With regard to commerce, persons and nations cannot pursue their private interests without simultaneously assisting the interests of others. The selfishness of, of European nations, including England, in establishing, quote, numberless bars, obstructions, and imposts on foreign trade is worse than immoral, worse than a crime that was a mistake. It's foolish and self-destructive. Hume does not, however, envision a world in which peaceful trade will ever completely replace war. In uh, uh, Of the Balance of Power brings Hume's discussion of political economy back to politics proper and his treatment of commerce and the middling rank of men full circle. The balance of power, of course, is the idea that weaker powers will band together to oppose the strongest power in any given situation. Hume asked whether the ancients knew about the balance of power or if it was a discovery of modern times. He concludes that while the balance of power could not have entirely escaped them, it failed them in one crucial case. The Romans never met, quote, any gen such general combination or confederacy against them, but were allowed peaceably to subdue their neighbors one after the other, until they extend their dominion over the whole known world. Here, the moderns are superior, Hume argues. The idea of a universal monarchy did not die with the Romans. It was taken up again in the modern, that is, post-Renaissance age, first by Charles V of Spain in the 16th century, and later by Louis XIV of France in the 17th and early 18th centuries. Louis' attempt was the most serious, and in the wars against his bid for universal monarchy, Britain, quote, has stood foremost 
Here we come back to the peculiar public spiritedness, the middling rank of men. Quote, beside Great Britain's advantage of riches and situation, her people are animated by such a natural, national spirit and are so fully sensible of the blessings of their government that we may hope their vigor will never will languish in so necessary and so just a cause. Modern commercial republicanism, it seems, is superior to ancient republicanism because it has found a more reliable basis for opposition to universal monarchy than the ancients found. We should just say he has an essay in which he basically sets out ancients versus moderns, the essay on the populousness of ancient nations. So he's just about to assert that moderns are superior to ancients. It seems to be part because of this argument he's just made. In a real sense, Hume's essays on commerce have come full circle. He started these essays by offering amoral advice to a sovereign about how to increase his power. But the advice that he gave, liberate commerce, has the consequence of creating a middle class that will want, sooner or later, to wrest power away from the monarch. Now, near the end of his essays on commerce, Hume shows us the, the regime of the middling rank of men at war with a sovereign striving for universal monarchy. Although it was disguised in Hume's original advice to the sovereign, tension between the middling rank of men and the sovereign's desire for unlimited self-aggrandizement has come out into the open. Let me summarize and conclude what I've said by offering a reflection on what's similar to our current discontents with our political economic regime, uh, what's similar to with our discontents uh, and Hume's defense of commerce and what's different. Today, we worry about the growing wealth of the 1% and the stagnant wa wages of workers in the American economy. Hume, I think, would share these concerns, although from a different angle and with a different set of worries in mind. Recall that Hume praises commerce because it undermines feudalism and eventually produced a politically assertive popular class that opposed the absolute monarchies of Europe. That could only happen because there was a widespread improvement in living standards, because ordinary people could free themselves of dependence on a single feudal lord and replace it with a dependence on a wider, more impersonal marketplace. Thus, while Hume would, I think, have, have been ambivalent about the growing wealth of people at the top, he would definitely would have regarded the stagnation of the middle or lower classes as a serious problem for the long-term health of the polity. And I, I, guess, I guess I would say that the connection between commerce and the improvement of living standards for Hume is not some kind of moral thing. It's, it's falsifiable, right? It's an empirical claim that may or may not be true. Uh, so far, he's similar to us. But this similarity masks a deeper difference. Us, concern about economic inequality is often a sentiment based in some conception of justice or morality, as if there were some absolute fairness which the world that we know fails to live up to. Hume's concern is more directly political. Without a middle class emotionally attached to the rule of law and believing that the rule of law serves their interests, constitutional government is not possible in the long run, or perhaps even in the short run. The important question, you might say, is not how to divvy up an economic pie according to some abstract notion of justice, but how to preserve and sustain a culture of constitutionalism. And that, in return, requires some reflection on how to get citizens to think for themselves, to reflect on their own interests, to essay in the word that Hume uses for the title of his book, and that by the end of the book, he tells us is another name for philosophy. It's not enough that people have the right opinions. It's far more important that they learn to think for themselves, to the extent that they can in the way, and in the way in which they can. But differently, the issue underlying Hume's treatment of commerce is the problem of enlightenment. That seems to me its most important legacy for us. Thank you. That can be okay. Anything? That's where they have all the cameras. No, I understand, but uh, I think you're fine. I'm okay. Okay. Yeah, Michael is relying on me for technological guidance. <laughs> Says something. Who better? <laughs> I'm sure there are many. <laughs> Takes a second.
we have a backup plan. Uh oh. <laughs> what, what was the front plan that failed? Well, no, we didn't have that. Okay. You tell me when I should start. What's up? Yes. It's in range. <laughs> uh, do you have any advice, Jimmy? Um, let's see if it's mirroring it. Uh, oh, no. There's no system preferences. That should be fine. That's the right way to do it. We might have to just. No, that's fine. That's it. <laughs> Displays. Uh, well, if this fails to if you could. Yes. You could do the singing that you need. No, you don't want to hear is that. Is the right thing punched on the console? Yes, it is. Okay. I hit the computer. Me too. And that's always happening to me. I haven't pushed the right button. I'll, I'll try the computer. Try all, yeah. try all buttons. <laughs> no. Something works. I don't know. But that's okay. So will music be okay? I mean, without the video? I, uh, yeah, if need, if need be, yeah. yeah. Better than nothing, as we say. Show mirroring options. Available to should be on. Oh, Michael, I brought you down again. It shows that it's on. Okay. Uh, let's try it. Let's go to group one. Okay. That's best hope. <laughs> okay, so let's try. Uh, oh, okay. I think we should be okay. It's just. I googled it and it's a potential solution. It says that the resolution might be too high on the computer. Oh, okay. Um, I'm sorry. No, we, we I'm having a good time. No, but okay, good. Okay, so going to display. Can be on display, right? Uh, so, uh, 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 display. Display. Oh, okay. go higher. Think a lower? Yeah, I think lower. So it's about 24 or 5. Okay. Did that do it? I'm sorry, Michael. You, you can still tell it's not going to work. Uh, I, mean, I don't even know how you can tell whether it's going to work. Or not. But why? I have the sound. <laughs> So, so it's not picking up the sound either. Uh, okay. So we might have to just do this from my computer, Michael. Okay. So let me. Okay. Because it's playing. Okay. Well. Oh, nobody can hear it. No. Yeah. We're not gonna go back. Yeah, I got to plug it. Okay. I think it's like it's up. Okay. I think it will be Okay. It's not loud. No, that's it. Is that what you can do? Yeah. All right. Well, okay, so let's go without it. I will do it.
I can get people to be quiet. I can act that. Well, I think we're ready to begin our the technology side of our conference. I'm sorry to say has failed. Michael had a wonderful video of Joel Gray and Liza Minnelli set up. Uh, for, for it worked earlier. I'm sorry I failed you. Now, Michael is going to start. And the sound of my computer is not as high as it should be, so can you tell, quiet. notwithstanding. Uh, so he's going to, so we're going to try, you have to listen carefully to the music. So we'll need. Okay, go ahead. Uh, okay, so today my topic is, Maestro. <laughs> <laughs> Monday makes the world go around. Go around. Go around. Go around. <laughs> All right. I do that'll be enough for now. <laughs> Sorry, though, for Mike. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Stuart. Um, Apologies, Michael. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to speak actually on Montesquieu on money. Um, a topic that I think fits the broader concern of this conference uh, quite well, the commercial republic, because uh, as already Tom suggested, um, Montesquieu was one of the prime 18th century theorists of that relatively new uh, social phenomenon. Um, now Montesquieu approached money in the context of his treatment of commerce, as is not at all surprising, but his approach to both money and commerce was governed by even larger concerns within his political philosophy as a whole. So I'm going to approach my topic somewhat indirectly and from afar, so to speak, in order to bring out what at least seems to me to be interesting and important about his treatment of money. So in order to set money and commerce into their proper context in Montesquieu's book, one must return almost to its very beginning. He was, like his uh, predecessors, Hobbes and uh, John Locke, a philosopher who posited a state of nature as the beginning point and a social contract as a key moment in his account of political society. But he made several important modifications on the state of nature uh, theory that he had inherited. Unlike Hobbes, he did not identify the state of nature with a state of war. Unlike Locke, he did not portray a state of war as the nearly inevitable result of the breakdown of the state of nature and as the prerequisite for the formation of civil society. Instead, he posited that in a state of nature, human, human beings would not be aggressive and hostile toward each other, as Hobbes had posited, but would instead be fearful and timid. They would flee rather than fight each other. But they would not stay apart indefinitely, he argued. As he put it, the marks of, animal, of mutual fear would soon persuade them to approach another. This tendency to approach would be encouraged by the pleasure animals take in the approach of an animal of its own kind. Notice he's treating human beings simply as, as uh, kinds of animals. This, uh, this pleasure would be perhaps even more encouraged by, as he so Frenchly puts it, the charm that the two sexes inspire in each other. <laughs> so for Montesquieu, unlike, say, Hobbes, society precedes rather than follows a state of war. Which state, the state of war, strange to say, follows on the appearance of society. As he says, as soon as men are in society, they lose their feeling of weakness. The equality that was among them ceases and the state of war begins only after society is formed. The Montesquieuian state of war is also more complex than the Hobbesian or the Lockean varieties. For his two predecessors, the state of war exists in the state of nature and can be described as Hobbes does, as a war of all against all. But for Montesquieu, there are in effect three kinds of war that emerge uh, in, this, in, the new, in the new situation. First, as human beings in society loses their, lose their weakness and timidity, as he puts it, each society also begins to feel its strength, producing a state of war among them. 
but the individuals within society also feeling their oats and seeking to turn to their favor the advantages of society, they too establish a state of war among themselves, that is to say, the use of force against fellow, fellow citizens or fellow uh, society members. So both the possibility of war with other societies and with other members of their own society lead in turn to the formation of governments, which are institutions within society capable of marshalling and coordinating the use of force against other societies and within their given society. But the existence of government, that is to say, an agency with great coercive power, ironically brings with it a new possibility of war, this time between the government and its own subjects or citizens. Because Montesquieu explicitly takes account of a level of complexity that Hobbes and Locke to say nothing of Rousseau later on, do not addr address so expressly. The Montesquieuian theory is a good deal more complicated than theirs is. He shares with Locke the goal of ending the state of war by putting in its place a regime of liberty where citizens are secure in their rights to life, liberty, property, and so on, and where they go about their lives without fear of their neighbors or of the neighboring nations or of their own governments. But such security is very difficult to achieve. Government can move towards securing its citizens from neighboring states by building up military power. Governments can secure the citizen against his or her fellow citizens by providing firm and effective rule of law, police, and punishment. At first, it seems then that the most intractable of the states of war <coughs> is the one introduced by the introduction of government. Montesquieu is impressed with the fact that the default position for governments seems to be despotism. Despotic regimes far outnumber free ones. One reason that despotism is so com common is that the efforts to resolve the first two kinds of state of war contribute to the power and potentially harmful character of government. We are familiar with this problem when we speak of the tension between concern for security against external enemies and the domestic need for liberty for the individual. Montesquieu is most famous for his solution to the problem of the state of war deriving from government itself, his theory of the separation of powers, which he claims goes far toward guaranteeing liberty. It is less often noted that the solution worked out in history to the problem of war between states is only a partial solution at best and continues to put pressure on the internal ordering of states. As evidence of this failure, we can point to the periodic outbreak of war among nations and the inability of balance of power international politics uh, to reliably secure peace. So long as war or threat of war remains a live possibility, the coercive authority of states vis-a-vis -vis their own citizens is augmented. So while Montesquieu appears to have, to have a theoretical solution to the seemingly intractable kind of war in his doctrine of separation of powers, this solution is less far-reaching than it appears because of the persistence of war among nations. Part four of the spirit of the laws is meant to provide a further or perhaps deeper solution to the problem. That part, part four, in which the chapter on money appears is on commerce. The significance of the section on commerce in the context of our present concern is captured extremely well in an early sentence of part four, as he says, the natural effect of commerce is to lead to peace. This is Montesquieu's way of announcing that commerce is the avenue along which the solution, or more of a solution anyway, to the hitherto intractable state of war between societies lies. The treatment of commerce is thus, in a sense, the capstone of Montesquieu's book. He signals its importance by prefacing his treatment of it with a prose poem invoking the muses, a highly unusual element of a very prosaic book. The muses, he writes, are never so divine as when they lead to wisdom and truth through pleasure. This thought captures his ideas about commerce quite well. Commerce operates through pleasure, that is to say, satisfying desires to produce a promise of overcoming the impediments to liberty posed by the various forms of the state of war. Placing Montesquieu's discussion of commerce in the context of his broader theory 
helps greatly in understanding some of the otherwise inexplicable oddities in his presentation. Unlike thinkers like Locke, who presented commerce mostly as a domestic matter, Montesquieu was concerned almost entirely with international commerce, a concern carried over even to his treatment of money. Commerce, he concludes, unites nations. It does so for a number of different reasons. Most primitively, perhaps, is the way in which commerce expresses mutual interests. As he says, two nations that trade with each other become mutually dependent. If one has an interest in buying, the other has an interest in selling. And all unions are founded on mutual needs. Complementary interests are a source of peace, for they point to the fact that peaceful exchange is a more reliable way to relate to other nations to get what one wants. Like all astute political thinkers, Montesquieu recognizes the power of interest in driving the affairs of human beings. But he also recognizes that interest is not the whole of it. There are nations, Rome is a good example, where the temper and the way of life of the citizens lead them to favor war and conquest over commerce. But so far as there is commerce, it produces what he calls gentle mores. As he says, it is an almost general rule that everywhere there are gentle mores, there is commerce. <clears throat> and everywhere there is commerce, there are gentle mores. Commerce, he says, perfects mores in the sense that it makes men more gentle, less martial. At the same time, commerce can be said, he tells us, to corrupt mores. Because from the point of view of the mores of a Sparta or a Rome, commerce is destructive, for it undermines the harshness and self-denial so central to these warlike nations. On the basis of this insight, regimes like the Spartans resisted, and philosophers like Plato denounced international trade. One reason for commerce's gentling effect is its ability to cure destructive prejudices, he tells us. It has this effect because based on interchange of goods and interaction of persons, it, he tells us, has spread knowledge of the mores of all nations everywhere, a process that has led to good things. Commerce and the resultant spread of knowledge of the mores of others gentles the human spirit in that it tempers the tendency of peoples to cling to their mores as the one best way to live, to cling to their gods as the one and only true gods, and to their sometimes powerful conviction that their mores and their gods must be affirmed by forcibly imposing them on others. Commerce leads to a more tolerant attitude, more of a live and let live attitude. Commerce produces human types more like Bill Gates than Attila the Hun. <laughs> the alternative to commerce that Montesquieu highlights <coughs> is banditry as a means of acquiring, as Aristotle called it. Banditry is unjust and forcible acquisition. Commerce is just and peaceful acquisition. Given the effects of commerce, Montesquieu has in mind a possible world order in which all people are caught up in commerce producing a world of intertwined interest and gentler mores. Such a world, he strongly implies, would be a much pacified world and one where the imperatives of war making and preparation for war making would have a much smaller impact on the domestic political life of nations. Such a vision had a large impact during the American founding era. For Alexander Hamilton felt forced to spend an entire number of the Federalists opposing the view that the American states, as commercial republics, could live together peacefully without need for a strong central government. The Montesquieuian theory had great purchase, has great purchase in contemporary thinking as well, for we see it at work in the widespread theory of the democratic peace. That is to say, the theory that democratic or modern commercially developed nations do not make war on each other. If all the nations were commercial republics, what a wonderful world it would be. But he knows very well that in world history, including the history of, own, of his own times, this has not been so. To get his grand vision into reality, he needs to address the issue of why some nations follow the path of brigandage rather than commerce, and to consider how to get them to change their ways. He concludes his very long chapter on the history of commerce 
with a discussion of the importance of the discovery of America and the way in which this discovery ended up tying the entire known world, Europe, Asia, Africa, and America, into one network of commerce. Globalization, he would say, is not an invention of the late 20th century. He focuses his attention on one nation in particular, the one most eminently involved with America at that time, the nation of Spain. Spain discovered America, but did not look at her as a potential commercial partner. Rather, Spain saw America as an object of conquest. He attributes this approach to America to the ambitions of Spain's Hap Habsburg rulers who sought a new kind of greatness, as he puts it, and saw America as supplying the means to achieve that greatness. America had a great supply of gold and silver and ready at hand mines to produce even more of these precious metals. Spain conquered and took. In order to work the mines, she had to import slaves from Africa forging the Europe to Africa part of the great developing commercial network. In his treatment of Spanish policy of plunder, brigandage, Montesquieu calls attention to the great paradox that had puzzled most observers of Europe in his day. The more wealth in the form of gold and silver that Spain extracted from America, the poorer she became. As Montesquieu puts it, Spain drew from the near, newly discovered world so prodigious a quantity of gold and silver that there was no possible comparison with what there had previously been in Europe. But contrary to everyone's expectations, poverty afflicted Spain. The king was obliged to declare, declare bankruptcy, and from this time forward, the Spanish monarchy went into an uninterrupted decline. The reason for the paradoxical result of Spain becoming even more impoverished as she became ever wealthier lay in the fact that, as he puts it, there was an internal and physical vice in the nature of this wealth which made it hollow. In a word, the Spaniards and nearly everyone else failed to understand the nature of money and its relation to wealth. It is this failure that prompts Montesquieu to develop his account of money. In the, in the following chapter, which has been pronounced the least written on part of the entire spirit of the laws. Um, this account, in turn, is part of his effort to turn more of the world toward genuine commerce and away from brigandage. For if the largest brigand in world history went bankrupt because of its devotion to brigandage, then the lesson that in the long run, brigandage does not pay might sink in. The Spaniards engaged in their very mistaken quest for wealth because they drastically misunderstood the nature of wealth. They believed that gold and silver are real wealth. But Montesquieu corrects them. These metals are only signs of wealth, not wealth itself. The same, only more so, goes for other forms of money, coins, paper money, and so on. This simple, and in his, in his, in his day, already somewhat familiar thesis, is regularly forgotten, he thinks, and its opposite, as often as not, as in Spain, serves as the basis of personal and public policymaking. Montesquieu had a familiar story about the origin of money, a story that one sees in one form or another in predecessors like John Locke. The original means of exchange, he tells us, is barter. One commodity held in excess by one party but in short supply for another is exchanged with another party with the opposite surplus and deficit. But the need for money shows itself readily when one considers the real complexities of barter exchange. The mutual needs of the two parties may not match in a way that make barter exchange possible, as one party may seek much of what the other party has to offer, <clears throat> but have only a little of what the other party wants. But that same party may have much of what a third party seeks, but may want only a little of their third party's commodities. Especially if there are distances involved, it is clear that barter is extremely limited as a means of carrying on commerce. The usefulness of a universal item of exchange, money, suggests itself to all parties to such complex bartering. Party A can thus trade its goods for money and use money to acquire the varying amounts of other goods it seeks from parties B and C. Montesquieu provides, further, a most plausible account of how gold and silver 
had come to be the most widely accepted forms of money. Metal, he tells us, is chosen to serve as money because it is durable, will be little worn by use, and can be divided many times without being destroyed. Not just any money will do, however. A precious metal is chosen so that it can be carried easily. Silver and gold meet the criteria very well, and thus they have become, in his day, the matter, the material of money. Since gold and silver are of universal value and can be used to purchase any goods, it is natural to think of them as wealth itself. This is the deep-rooted source of the Spanish policy of extracting as much gold and silver from its American possessions as possible. This is a capital error, however, for money, he tells us again, is a sign of wealth and not wealth itself. His account of the emergence of gold and silver makes that point well, because money comes on the scene as a measure or equivalent of given quantities of useful, uh, of useful commodities and serves essentially to store and transport that value to facilitate exchange. Perhaps the most striking way, however, in which Montesquieu makes his point about the real nature of money is through his imaginative account of a practice he attributes to the blacks on the coast of Africa. This practice enables them to avoid the money illusion the illusion that money is wealth, for in it, he tells us, they have a sign of values without money. As he describes it uh, as follows, they, the Africans, have a purely ideal sign founded on the degree of esteem they have in mind for each com commodity in proportion to the need for it. We might note here that for Montesquieu, value is the esteem people place on things, an esteem related to their need for it or to, its, to their estimate of its use value in their lives. It is a common, not a purely individual estimate of use value, set in some sort of market-like bidding and counterbidding, but over time reaching a kind of stability. As he explains, the Africans may assess a certain product or committee, uh, a commodity to be worth three makuts. Uh, makuts is what they call these units of exchange. Three makuts, another say six makuts, another say 10 makuts. It is as if they simply said three, six, and 10. A makut is a purely ideal entity. It has no physical embodiment, whatever. Despite that, it serves perfectly well, in certain limited contexts, the function of money, in that it facilitates a price system. The price of a given commodity can be set in makuts, but is actually formed by the comparison they make of all the commodities with each other. There is no gold or silver. Indeed, there is nothing that is only money, but each kind of commodity is money for the other. The Makut system is clearly much closer to a system of barter, but it allows the asymmetrical exchanges that Montesquieu had identified as the source of the need and value of money. The Makut, as a purely ideal instrument of exchange, will refute the Spanish view regarding money. No one will make war in order to seize their neighbor's Makuts. Yet the Makut is a remarkably sophisticated intellectual construct, for it has made the leap into abstractness characteristic of money. It is a measure of value of all goods relative to all goods, rather than of commodity to commodity, as in a pairwise barter relation. Yet for all its theoretical value, the Makut cannot serve the interests of trade well, especially not of international trade. Theoretically, it serves as a common measure of the value of all commodities, but in practice, it cannot move much beyond the barter system. Makuts are still more or less limited to face-to-face -face exchanges in an actual physical marketplace. In order to be generally useful to commerce, the makut, or purely ideal money, must take on flesh and become portable, fixed, and stable, and therefore of use in exchanges over distance and time and easily capable of supporting asymmetric exchanges, as even the Makut can only partially do. But when the Makut or ideal measure becomes material, it retains the abstractness of the Makut. It is not a commodity in itself, like a bed, but is a common sign and common measure of wealth. Thus, as Montesquieu has explained, gold and silver, by a sort of natural process, become nearly universally accepted as money. But there is another important step before we arrive at money as we know it, or as it was known in his day. Gold and silver, for the reasons he identifies, become the measure of wealth 
But in order for them to serve practically as money, the state steps in to transfer the metals into coins. With coins, we have the real deal. Money, 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 as Joel Gray tells us. Coins testify to the amount and grade or purity of the precious metal in the coin. It stamps a certain value on the particular bit of metal. But what looks to be a step toward fixity can turn into the opposite, a vehicle for fraud. Both citizens and rulers are tempted to devalue coins in reality while maintaining their staked, uh, stamped or now ideal value. So coin clipping and fraudulent mint practices compromise the stamped value of coins and throw out of equilibrium the money's value as a sign of wealth. This can be to the immediate advantage of the clippers and to the government, but in response arises what Montesquieu considers one of the most marvelous innovations of all time, the exchange. That is to say, the money changers who function to equilibrate the value of the various coinages. The exchange becomes an indispensable vehicle for international trade. It is necessary to facilitate the role of money in commerce, and this is necessary to commerce's contribution to solving or mitigating the political problem of the state of war between societies. To establish the thesis that money is only a sign of wealth is to counter the tendency of nations to consider gold and silver to be real wealth. A true understanding of money encourages trade rather than brigandage, for it leads, he argues, to an emphasis on production of commodities, real wealth, rather than to a concentration on precious metals. It also points to the irrationality and limitations of certain political attempts to manipulate money, such as coin clipping and set of setting artificial value on coinage. The correct understanding of money is thus a path to a salutary commerce, and a salutary commerce is a step toward the solution of the political problem itself through its power to obviate or tame war. Money and commerce also facilitate liberty in domestic relations. As he says, the exchange hampers despotic states, for it undercuts the ability of despots to dominate the economy and to plunder the wealth holding and wealth creating elements of society. Indeed, near the end of his discussion, Montesquieu goes beyond even his predecessor, John Locke, who had argued that the introduction of money tended to unleash labor and productivity by establishing a way to store value and thus incentivize labor. Montesquieu goes beyond when he insists that, as he puts it, commerce itself is in contradiction to despotic laws. The people in a despotism comprise only slaves attached to the land and slaves called ecclesiastics or gentlemen because they are the lords of these slaves. There remains, therefore, scarcely anyone for the third estate, the middle, middling people Tom was talking about, uh, which is formed of workers and merchants. That is to say, the despotic system makes slaves of all its members, even those who seem to be masters. Commerce frees them because it makes restrictive laws on labor and land more difficult to maintain. Thus, money and its offspring commerce contribute to the solution of two, and perhaps even all three, of the states of war. No wonder Montesquieu sings songs of praise to the muses on, their, on commerce's behalf. Montesquieu clearly does not agree with the biblical verse, 1 Timothy 6.10, that money <laughs> is the root of all evil. He has a clearly positive assessment of money. But I do not want to leave you with the idea that he was Pollyannish and did not see some of the costs of commerce and of the use of money. As he points out, we see in countries that are affected only by the spirit of commerce, this is a Frenchman speaking about England, that there is traffic in all human activities and all moral virtues. The smallest things, those required by humanity, are done or given instead for money. And so to close with the immortal words of the Beatles in the spirit of Montesquieu, can we do that or not? <laughs> oh, we can. Oh, we can. Oh. Wait, wait, wait. Because, all right, all right, all right. Yes, uh, this is actually what my wife played for me before we got married. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Oh,
to. It's the part of the start. Michael, I thought you were going to reference the other Beatles tune, which is the best things in life are free, but you can give me to the burden of these. I want the money. There are many, many. I was going to, you know, since today, April 15th, traditional tax day, I was going to play Tax Man also. Right. But uh, When he mentioned it's a wonderful life in his talk, I thought, it's really not in his paper. I looked over his shoulder, and he's just digging it in on me. Uh, but I assume uh, uh, Michael or Tom working together cooperatively will call on people who have comments or questions. Stuart, is it true that we're getting paid in the coops? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Please. I have a question for, for Tom um, about the interaction amongst the middle and the sword. Does, does Hume sort of understand all of this as kind of form? Is commerce a form of conversation? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I mean, this is something that David said last night, that commerce is right, the trading things, but also kind of metaphor for all kinds of interactions, right, from high to low. So and I think that, that, Hume, that, that Hume very much has that sense that it's, that it's a metaphor that is suggestive and that has many different dimensions. So and I think that partly it's just, you know, having people talk to each other, right? And, you know, having people come to college, there's a sort of discipline and just having them actually talk to each other every night you know, for you know, four years. Whatever that that's um, is, is a good thing by itself. So maybe more good than what we actually do in class. Nathan, uh, what do you guys do with the history of commercial republics from Athens to Florence and Venice, all of which are martial, imperialist, expansionist? Some of them can, some of them less successful than others. What do we do with them? <laughs> what do you do with them? How does one differentiate them from the ideal commercial republic they're interested in? What happens to actual previous commercial republic? Uh, well, um, so I think that the place to look for that would be the populousness of ancient nations, when he has this kind of comparison between, he says, well, there's some republicans and you think about today's debate about republicanism, you know, the scholarly debate. So, well, some people want to go back to ancient republics, but actually ancient republics were really horrific places. I mean, I think for Hume, the discussion of Athens is really um, ultimately has to do with slavery, that this is, this is an economy that's based on um, some people having to work either for individuals or for the polity. And, um, and that there's, it's actually his least skeptical moment, so far as I can see, that he says things like, um, well, this is an arrangement that's against the eternal laws of reason and equity. You sort of wonder, like, oh, where in the world did Hume come up with the eternal laws of reason and equity? Um, but I think, the, I think that it's a, for him, it's ultimately a matter of technology. The technology allows you to solve that question. Um, and um, I, I mean, I certainly don't think, he makes a case against imperialism, but basically on the grounds that you shouldn't take more than you can hold. Um, as opposed to you should never invade other countries. Um, so I'm not so sure that he's opposed in principle to their practice, but I think there's, he thinks there's a kind of folly here that they go back to um, I, I think, you know, I think most of you and you may have very similar points of view on a lot of these issues. Yeah. So I would also say slavery, I think, from most of his point of view, is a very important piece of it, that um, the ancient republics were grounded on slavery, and that had a big effect on their aspirations. So for example, um, uh, to acquire slaves becomes a, a reason why they go to war. I think in, uh, also he would, he would argue that the international context was pressed on the ancient republics in a, uh, in a way that made it difficult for them to simply avoid concern with war. So for example, um, you might be a commercial republic yourself, and yet um, you're in an inter international con uh, context in which being merely a peace-loving uh, commercial society isn't going to suffice to say nothing of, um, I guess I would put it, uh, and, and this is the kind of um, concern that I think Montesquieu brings to bear over and above uh, the claims of the, or the kind of arguments that his modern, modernist predecessors tended to make, that there was a moral spirit, a, a, a moral character to ancient life that made military virtue extraordinarily attractive 
and difficult, even in a commercial society, to ignore. Um, and so it didn't come in, uh, it, 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 the commercial spirit couldn't fully come into its own in that kind of context. And then a third point, again, related to something Tom said about Hume. Um, a lot of the history of commerce that uh, Montesquieu presents is a history of innovation, technological innovation. This is the, the discovery of the compass, things like that, that make, that liberate commerce in a way that it never was before, make it really big. But it's not just ancient. The Dutch Republic, Florence, Venice, the modern commercial republics are also more like and to some of them involved in the slave trade too. Um, not to mention yeah. the American Republic, slaveholding republic, which was shortly founded at the time. He doesn't, so far as I recall, he isn't, doesn't address that expressly. Um, I mean, to some degree, I think his argument has to be seen as advocacy rather than simply description, that this would be a better way to go. And he's very, you know, he's a strong opponent of slavery. And I think one of the things he's trying to do is to encourage nations to think outside, you know, to, to, to try to move away from slavery, that's for sure. Um, so, this is maybe one of the, how should we say, unintended uh, or downside consequences of the discovery of the New World. So the New World opens a market for slavery that doesn't exist in Europe itself. That is, the Europeans aren't importing slaves into Europe. They're importing slaves into the New World. Um, and so I think he would see that as, as a factor that's running counter to the natural or normal tendency of commerce itself. Um, and um, as Montesquieu, I, I think it's characteristic of the book as a whole that he, and, and what makes it difficult, I think, to put all the fact features of it together at once, he, he has a sense of an immense number of variables or considerations that are relevant to political behavior uh, or, the, 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 or the spirit that emerges in a given place. But he subjects them all to individual treatment. That is, he doesn't really put, put them together. So we have separate treatments of commerce, of religion, of um, economic foundations, so to speak. Um, and, what, and in this case, he has a treatment of commerce somewhat isolated from this issue that you're raising of exceptional circumstances that might lead in a somewhat different direction. Uh, and he leaves the reader, I think, the challenge of integrating these factors that he treats in a more or less isolated way. Each one gets its own treatment. You see what each of them in isolation would do. But what we don't see, what, which is necessary, is how really he sees them interacting. Um, and this all important concept that he introduces in the spirit of laws, that is the idea of spirit, um, uh, is he insists always a product of the interaction of these things, but he hardly ever gives us an example of how he sees that interaction working. So this would be, I think, a, another instance of that, maybe on a smaller scale. Hey, I guess as a follow-up to that, um, so with, um, and let's use account of commerce, I mean, he uses England as kind of the exemplary example of a commercial state. Um, in particular, he cites England's liberty. Um, and he does cite, you know, um, you know, effect effectively a grocery list of social, of you know, topographical, sociological, historical factors that lead to this liberty in England. So, I wonder to what extent could he expect another state? You know, if, if Congress is going to bind states together, to what extent can we expect kind of this, even a second exemplary commercial state, kind of the one that we would really expect to be driving, kind of this, you know these softer moors and such. To what, expect, to what extent can we expect such a state to arrive naturally and not by force from one of these commercial states? Hmm. If that question makes any sense. I didn't hear Hume in that, in that sentence. Yeah, so yeah, I, okay. I feel obligated not to answer the question. <laughs> um, well, this is, one of the, this is one of the big questions that I think is related to the point I just made, which is to say, uh, how the various factors actually interact to produce uh, a, a given result. 
he seems to see that there are there's something about commerce that does appeal in a way related related I think to Tom's presentation, whether Jung was mentioned in this question or not. <laughs> uh, in, in that he wants, I mean, he tries to show. Look, there are there are uh, self interested reasons why states could and should engage in commerce. And he sees commerce as both, and this is what another thing that makes you, uh, Montesquieu's political science maybe more complicated than any other political science that's ever been developed. Uh, commerce is both a, as we'd say in our, uh, the other wing of our department, uh, a dependent and an independent variable. Um, and so commerce is the result of lots of causes, but it also can be a cause of lots of effects. And I think he, what his, what, one of the things he's trying to do is to encourage it as a cause. That is, uh, we can find reasons to introduce commerce, and commerce in turn will then produce other effects that will point lead us towards um, liberty, uh, middle, the, the role of middling classes, uh, constitutionalism, uh, all of those things that he also values. I think we have time for one more question. That's it. Session. Okay. Um, yeah, so thank you. Well, it's been a great, great paper. I have two questions. So I have first, okay. but I'll start with the question. I might go on. Um, so, uh, Tom, there was one point in your paper where I, I failed to follow you, uh, and that was when you suggested that commercialism leads to 1649 and the execution of Charles I. Uh, and it seemed to me, just as I was you know, reflecting on Hume's history in those passages, you know, he doesn't present that as an action that arises from commercial agents. I mean, it's a kind of rainbow coalition of gloomy religious fanatics, yes. uh, embryonic, <laughs> yeah. and Republicans, <laughs> relentless military despots, but not yeah. merchants and traders. So I yes. just wonder whether you could say a little bit more to try and bring me on board with the idea. Sure, of the yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, the way that I read Hume is um, this whole co commerce thing. I mean, we sort of think that he's talking about the 18th century. I think he's th th talking about something that happens under the Tudors between, say, 1500 and 1600. And he thinks that, that um, there's this sort of great economic growth that is a kind of condition for all of these people who become politically served. Now, granted, it's completely true that they don't present themselves as Scottish Enlightenment, commercial, we're trying to found a regime that's based on individual liberty or things like that. But I think he thinks that the, the economic growth is the condition for these people. So, that, so there's a passage near the beginning of um, volume five of the history when he talks about the fermentation. There's this kind of eruption of all these different ideas coming around. And I, I guess I would just distinguish, and maybe this is important, that sometimes when we talk about commerce, it sounds so it's an automatic process that as soon as you start trading, everyone's going to become friendly towards each other. And I think Hume's sense is that the commerce part is important, that there's more wealth. But there are all of these political deeds that have to happen before you can actually have a regime. Um, and so that's the part that I think is, is really important. And, and you're completely right that religion is, plays a big role there. So I don't know if that answers, but that's it. Thank you very much. Let us thank our two speakers. <laughs>